All right. Well, welcome back to the main page, everyone. Hopefully everybody's made it back. Uh, thank you for taking part in the summit so far through the three tracks. Uh, we are excited to take the last few steps in the summit today with the uh, uh, a presentation, or I'm sorry, not a presentation, a, a welcome from Mayor Tenhagen and then our keynote speaker. Uh, one more time, I do want to mention our sponsors for today's summit, ISG, HDR, East Dakota Water Development District, AE2S, and Soil and Water Conservation Society. We thank them greatly for their contributions to help make this summit possible. With that, I'm going to uh, enable Ms. Mayor Tenhaken here to speak. I would note that because we do not have a presentation on this, uh, if you want to uh, change your viewing options, I believe there's a button in the upper right to change it so you're able to see Mayor Tenhaken. With that, I will switch it over to Mayor Tenhaken. All right. Thanks, Andy. Um, let's see. Am I on? Everything's good. You can hear me. You can see me. Sounds good. These, uh, yeah, these virtual conferences are just a gas, aren't they, Andy? I've been too organized this, so yes. sorry. Yeah, sorry that we can't meet in person. That's a real bummer. Uh, if you're like me, there was a lot of excitement around doing zoom presentations like this early on back in like may and june and it was this new adventure and now you probably have as much zoom fatigue as i do i feel like i sit in this chair all day and just do a zoom so uh thanks for making this work with your schedule um i want to i want to also thank the sponsors uh, i want to thank everybody who's on the uh uh the conference today for taking time out for this uh, important topic you know i was thinking about what I would talk about here for a little bit. And uh, would also like to say that as I'm talking here, if you have any questions, you could certainly chat them in the chat box there. Um, the only topic that's off limit is COVID. Let's just not talk about COVID. I'll talk about anything else right now. Talk about the Vikings, we can talk about uh, anything. It's not COVID, uh, but was thinking about what we would talk about. And I really do wanna talk about a result of COVID which has been um, the, the, the kind of the economic interest in our state over the last, I would say really six months. So what, what's happened in the last six months in the city of Sioux Falls um, is the interest in people moving here, as well as businesses either relocating here, expanding here, looking at setting up new businesses here, moving across the border, uh, we have so many examples of that and so many conversations that are being had right now uh, as a result of COVID. And what's driving that is, is a few different things. It's, you know, that economic climate, maybe in some other states that uh, it's not great. Uh, and maybe COVID was the straw that broke the camel's back for our business and say, hey, maybe it's time we go across the border from Minnesota to South Dakota or uh, from California to South Dakota. We're seeing some of those as well. Um, but what's been interesting is, as, as we've kind of had some of these conversations with businesses, especially businesses that are either um, a ways out of our market, maybe they're from the coasts or from the south or, or whatnot, as well as younger people that are looking to relocate to Sioux Falls, which there's a lot of those as well right now. There's a few topics that always come up as they're kind of assessing our market. Uh, one is they're always asking about the diversity in our community, all right? They're asking, what's the diversity like in your city? Um, and they want to know cultural makeup. They want to know what diversity um, activities we have, what sort of diversity initiatives we have going on. Second thing they're, they're often asking about is our cultural arts and amenities. So when we invest in things like the State Theater, which will be opening this week in Sioux Falls, uh, or zoo, libraries, parks, you know, people are really interested in those amenities when they're looking at making a decision on where to relocate. But there are a lot of people who ask about what sustainability and like resiliency initiatives we have and 
what we're doing, uh, long and short of it, for the environment, uh, especially with our with younger people. It's a very important topic. Uh, and well, it's obviously important to all of us on this call and on this session, and we know the value of that as the you know, we see this kind of generational shift happening. The topic of sustainability and resiliency is going to be a real defining factor for cities to recruit employees, to recruit businesses, um, and to make your community attractive. Uh, and so that's why, you know, when you talk about topics like the, the Big Sioux River and the preservation of that, uh, and again, I know you guys are all from up and down the watershed and have role all, you know, all along the watershed. I'm, I'm obviously biased you know, being the mayor of Sioux Falls. You know, I very selfishly want to preserve, uh, you know, as as much um, quality cleanliness uh, of the Big Sioux River in our city as we can, because it's, it's quite honestly one of the assets that we show off because we we built an entire downtown around it. And so we have a real best interest as well to to preserving that asset. Uh, last year, uh, earlier, well, no, I guess it was this year, this spring, um, I got appointed by uh, Commissioner Andrew Wheeler, who's the EPA commissioner, to uh, a committee called the Local Government Advisory Committee, or it's called the LGAC. And the LGAC consists of uh, and maybe it's 25 or 30 different city mayors, uh, commissioners, county commissioners, tribal uh, authorities from all over the country that help advise uh, Commissioner Wheeler and the EPA on different initiatives that are important to us at the local level, at municipal level. Issues related to air, issues related to water, issues related to land, three different subcommittees there. I'm really new to that. We've only had one meeting. Our second meeting is actually tomorrow. Uh, COVID has kind of put a little bit of wrinkle in our work as well. And I'm really hoping to get appointed to the water committee uh, on that because of while land and air are really important to you know us as well, um, it's kind of a special place in my heart for the river and for water quality in our region. Uh, and so hopefully we'll know more on that tomorrow. But I think the point of me sharing that is is it will give Sioux Falls an opportunity to have kind of a voice on a little bit larger stage and indirectly some uh, some uh, authority, I guess you will, with the EPA through this LGAC committee, which I'm really excited to be a part of. You know, uh, Andy introduced me here, and I know a lot of you know Andy, um, but uh, Andy and Holly Meyer and others with the city have worked on several uh, initiatives here in Sioux Falls that not only are environmentally friendly, but are also good for, um, you know, for a river. One of those is, is a low impact development pilot that we have uh, going on in the north part of Sioux Falls that I won't get into the details on that because uh, quite honestly, I'm not qualified to, but the point of that being, uh, there are different things that we're continuing to try to do in, in Sioux Falls, like low impact development, uh, like no mow zones, which we continue to do more and more of. Uh, our continued river cleanup efforts and just overall runoff reduction strategies that we have to continue to deploy um, to ensure that we're you know preserving that asset the best we can. What I really encur am encouraging that team to do and will continue to encourage them to do is to always experiment on those development initiatives as we work with developers uh, that are developer friendly but are also environmentally friendly. And a lot of times it seems like it's either or. It's like e either the developers like it or the tree huggers like it. <laughs> and you know, there's sometimes they're at conflict with each other because quite honestly, the least environmentally friendly options um, are often the ones that developers prefer because they're quicker, they're faster, a lot of times they're less expensive. If you even just think about like lead certification and so forth, there's a reason a lot of places don't pursue lead certification because of the cost and it's just not feasible. So what we need to be doing, uh, especially when we work with developers as our communities continue to uh, expand outward and that, that sprawls a whole nother issue that kind of creates challenges is ensuring that we're doing things that um, are environmentally friendly, low impact development, things like that, that will continue to help with 
runoff and water quality initiatives and so forth. So what I've really noticed over the past, uh, I don't know if this was COVID related or not, but the past year or two, the recreational use in the Big Sioux River here in Sioux Falls has dramatically increased uh, to the point where our Parks and Rec Department is looking at different, uh, you know, kayak and canoe storage and rental opportunities actually along the river and ways to make that even more accessible uh, for people to utilize right now. Um, and so as the river becomes more and more of a recreational tool for people and a recreational attraction, I think the community will care more and more about its overall purity and cleanliness. It's just going to go hand in hand because the more people that actually get in that river and experience it uh, are going to want to hopefully do their part to preserve it and, and to take care of it. And the last thing that I think though is really important, you guys, is um, we have to continue to just educate people on things that you know John Q. Citizen can do. Uh, to indirectly and directly uh, impact the quality of that Big Sioux River. And there's a lot of things, whether it's the way people uh, mow their lawn, fertilize their lawn, you know, take care of their own property, to what they do with, with pet waste, you know, for instance, and, and some very, what seemingly simple things like that, that can have a big impact. And, you know, Andy and I have talked about this in the past of, you know, you you clean up after your back lab or your black, clean up in the back after your black lab, um, <laughs> the easy thing to do is just to dump that in the reeds out behind your house and kind of the spillway, which uh, that obviously indirectly just runs off and eventually makes its way into our waterway. And I think if people knew that and really thought, you know, that there's a connection between that river cleanliness and the way that you're handling your pet waste on your property, uh, those are the educational aspects that we have to continue to reinforce to people. The no mow zones are a good example of that, at least along our bike path here, where we have those educational signs kind of encouraging people, hey, this isn't the city being lazy, this is a no mow zone. And this is why it's important to get that root base really deep, you know, to preserve uh, the soils and the nutrients along that river basin. Uh, so, I think the the thing that's really important about this summit, and I would like to even see it, you know, be more than just an annual thing, even if possible, is that there's so much collaboration that has to happen up and down that watershed, because a lot of times, for instance, I get questions from from the public on Paul, what are what are you doing to clean up the river? What are you doing to make our river uh, swimmable? You know, a lot of people want to talk about when can I swim in the river? I'm like, well. Hold your horses. It's gonna be okay. We're not there yet, but it starts all the way up, you know, by Watertown and all the way down. And we all have a part to play in that. Each community, each agricultural plot along the way, uh, and so it, nothing can happen in a vacuum unless we work together on all these things. So, for instance, if we develop standards for that low impact development along the river and, and in different communities that we can start to all adapt similar practices with a similar goal in mind. Uh, I think that's going to be very important for the cleanliness of that asset going forward. When I ran for mayor, a guy ran against, um, now he's in the legislature, Greg Jamison. He would always call the river liquid gold. He's like, oh, we got liquid gold running through our city. And I always think of it like that because this this city has built hundreds of millions of dollars in investments, probably billions of dollars when you actually add it all up. North of a billion dollars of investments in our downtown, all along the river, in a bike trail, all because we want to be along this river, and we're built around this river. And so it seems like it, a pretty simple decision and a pretty you know simple task to say. Hey, how can we take care of this asset that this whole city is kind of centered around and built around and one of our best assets? So when you think of it like liquid gold, that's a great way to think of our river. And what would you do to protect liquid gold and make sure that, you know, that liquid never stops and continues to give back to your community? So I just want to thank, you know, I want to thank the work of everybody on this call, uh, you know, all the engineers, the environmental analysts, uh, you know, I see, uh, all kinds of city employees on this call. Troy, I see is on here. Troy Lambert uh, with our environmental team. Great guy that 
I learned multiple times a week, goes to our river, drops a bucket from a bridge. And I said, like Little House on the Prairie, man, he drops a bucket down there like a well, brings it up, tests the quality on site. So we're monitoring this on the regular to make sure we're doing the right things. Um, and when we aren't and when things are getting off, we got to continue to work together to say, how can we continue these preservation efforts? So thanks for all the collaboration. Thanks for the work everybody on this call does uh, on this very, very important topic for, uh, for our community. Um, with that, I certainly would take any questions in the last couple minutes, if anybody has any uh, in the chat over there for me. Uh, I don't see any. Well, it, it comes to me, Mayor, so I'll, I'm checking it out here. Uh, we don't have a question yet, but we do have a comment uh, from Barry Berg. It just says, the Big Sioux River Project would like to thank Mayor Tenhaken for keeping the energy going with the summit, and we appreciate the close connection with the project. We would not be able to be as successful without you. Well, that means a lot. And is Barry your brother? He is not. Okay. We just work together. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you were logged in as another bird and you put that comment in. I'm like, oh, that's, that's real nice. So, no, yeah. thanks, thanks, Barry. Appreciate it, man. Yep. So. Um, let me see here. Who should people reach out to if they wanted to work with the city on these issues? Well, uh, the first point of contact, I would say, would be Holly Meyer, who's on this call here. Uh, Holly leads. Uh, our sustainability um, programs for the city. Uh, Holly's got an incredible heart and an incredible mind for this work. So um, Holly would be the first point of contact. Uh, Holly indirectly reports to Andy for the, for the city of Sioux Falls. So uh, as cities grow, what you see oftentimes is a, is a title of a lot of times chief resiliency officer. You know, like Miami has that. St. Paul has a chief resiliency officer, and they are they are uh, strictly tasked with preserving and maintaining resiliency efforts, not just on things like this, but everything, whether it's solid waste or just the environment in general. I think as we get to be a bigger city and a bigger community, our resiliency efforts, including elevating that role of a resiliency officer in the city, is going to be important. Um, because of the importance that that topic plays, not only in our community, but with people, like I said, who want to come here. Uh, I think we have a lot more we can do here. And part of that is just, quite honestly, in the Midwest, we're a little slow to this stuff. We don't see the impact sometimes of, like, sea level rising like you do in Miami. They, they see daily what climate change is doing, you know, to their community. We're a little bit slower to see that and realize that. Uh, and so I think it's important that we, uh, you know, grab kind of the brass ring now if we can and highlight some of this stuff so that we're not kind of behind when we need to be, uh, you know, bringing some of these initiatives forward. All right. Uh, can we bring the water summit back to Watertown? The river and its problems begin up here. We need to work on and publicize the entire basin top to bottom. Well, that's a great question, and that's for the event organizers. I would love to see this thing, you know, because it used to be called the, you know, the mayor's summit, you know, and we kind of talked about, you know, is this really about mayors or is this really about everybody involved? Is it really about the Big Sioux, you know, watershed in general? Um, I think that makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, and after all, you got water in your name. So it would seem like uh, that would be the, <laughs> the best place to have the summit. But did it used to be up there, Andy, though, just for my. We 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 had it in Sioux Falls for, I think, two years. Then we went to Brookings and then okay. Sioux Falls, then Watertown and then back to Sioux Falls again. And so obviously this year being a bit different, but uh, certainly, you know, our group that does a lot of planning for it are open to alternate locations and if somebody wants to take the the wheel on that we'll, we'll assist as necessary as long as we keep it going you know keep the momentum yeah, yeah for sure for sure i do not yeah. see any other comments or questions at this time so um mayor uh thank you very much for taking the time to jump on here with us and we greatly do appreciate it like barry said your support for all of these efforts that we in-house are doing and that uh, the folks online uh, do on their end as well. 
Yeah, you bet, Andy, and thank you for your work and everybody on this call. Uh, thanks for all you do. If you have anything you'd like to reach out to my office uh, on, anything related to this, uh, mayor at SiouxFalls.org is a great email address to catch me at. So thank you uh, and enjoy your final keynote here. Have a good day, guys. Thank you. Dr. May Davenport is a professor in the Department of Forest Resources and the director for, of the Center for Changing Landscapes at the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. Her teaching and research focuses on one, human environmental values, beliefs, and behaviors, and second, community level engagement in environmental decision making. Her research program is particularly centered on community based planning and policy for water protection climate resilience and environmental justice. She teaches courses on sustainable land use planning and policy and social science research methods. Recently, May has worked in partnership with tribal natural resource managers in present day Minnesota and Wisconsin to respect tribal sovereignty and conduct responsible research to protect Manumen or I can't uh, pronounce that one. Wild rice, a sacred medicine and food to the Anishinaabeg and Dakota peoples. Hopefully, I didn't butcher that too bad, me. I will. There you go. Hopefully, that'll unmute you. Okay. okay. And then, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm wondering how I share my screen. I'm doing that right now. Okay. Now you should be able to. Okay, let me find the button. <laughs> Let's see. Is there a share down towards the bottom by the video and mute buttons? I do see that. Thank you. Okay. Now, are you able to see my main screen with the title? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> well, thank you, everyone. I'm so excited to um, be able to chat with you about some of my work here in Minnesota. Um, I want to thank Colin and Troy and especially Holly Meyer for inviting me to join you this afternoon. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I believe so. All right. Awesome. So I want to start actually with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm working from my home office in St. Paul in the state of Minnesota. Um, South Dakota and Southern Minnesota are the ancestral, traditional and contemporary lands of the Sioux, or more accurately, the Ocheti Shakoween, uh, meaning seven council fires. I recognize the inherent sovereignty of the tribal nations and the resilience and strength of their communities today. I respect this land and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past that have impacted the land and water and the indigenous peoples here. Uh, me as a settler colonizer, I have benefited from the taking and occupation of these lands. And I think that's really important to acknowledge and for me to reflect on in my work. My employer, the University of Minnesota has also benefited from uh, the policies and actions of colonization. Acknowledging the, this history and the injustices that continue today is really important for collective healing as we move forward with respectful relationships with indigenous peoples and honoring the land and water together. So I'm going to be um, talking to you a little bit uh, this afternoon about what water teaches us. Um, and specifically, I wanna think about not only what water teaches us about the natural world, but what it teaches us about our relationships to one another. Water relation, water resources are community resources. Water resources are cultural resources. And for me, the critical question that, that I contemplate on a day-to-day -day basis um, in terms of solving water problems is not exactly what to do, but how to do it. And so um, I have sort of five big lessons that I'd like to share with you today. Um, I have about, I think about 40 minutes, 35 or 40 minutes of content, and then I hope we can have a, a really good discussion. Questions and feedback from you would be awesome. So here are some lessons that I've learned 
um, and the work that I've done. Uh, water problems are social problems. Conventional water policies and programs um, have been problematic, uh, particularly because they put practices before people. Social action and institutional change are essential to solving water problems. Water justice is everyone's responsibility. And um, ultimately, we need a community-centered framework, a human community-centered framework uh, for protecting water. And so for the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about each of these lessons um, and also uh, present to you some research findings from work that I've done and colleagues of mine and students and staff at the Center for Changing Landscapes have been a part of to better understand the human relationship to water um, and relationships to each other uh, in the water context. So first of all, um, two, two decades of social science research on the human and social dimensions of water um, have confirmed to me that water problems are social problems. And this probably comes as no surprise or um, doesn't challenge your way of thinking about water. All the hydrologic models, the engineered infrastructure, and the technology fixes um, in the world don't get us past the fact that social systems are the fundamental drivers of water resource problems. And, and the mayor suggested that in, in his welcome. The challenge lies not in knowing what to do to protect water, where to put stormwater management practices, um, but in how to support and inspire conservation actions at a scale that will make a real difference. So how do we, wa how do we center water in our land use planning and policy? How do we develop a community-based approach to protecting water that acknowledges our primal social and cultural connections to water? For me, um, collecting water narratives has been critically important to understanding the human water connections. Our water narratives really are reflect our relationships with water they include water values, beliefs, behaviors, and cultural identities. Um, narratives also include um, how we are affected positively and negatively by water decisions. Decisions at multiple scales, including decisions our neighbors make, maybe upstream from us, but also, and, and I would argue, especially decisions that our socio-political institutions of governance make. Minnesota, as, as you may know, has very rich water narratives. Uh, we call ourselves the land of 10,000 lakes, and I would argue we have about 10,000 narratives of water here in this state. There's a dominant narrative of abundant sky blue waters, as you can see in this Ham's Beer ad. Um, Residents and tourists spending weekends at the cabin, fishing and swimming. Um, there are also hidden narratives of water that you might not have heard about, uh, in which indigenous peoples whose cultural identities are, tar are tied to harvesting wild rice or monomen um, are losing this sacred gift from the creator because of changing land uses, including mining, changing climate, and a political system that doesn't um, enforce its own regulations meant to protect wild rice. Last fall, and this is me holding um, that uh, uh, pole and the ricing sticks. Last fall, I went on my first ricing trip. Um, and that experience and uh, working collaboratively with, collaboratively with tribes has transformed my own personal water narrative. So water narratives, importantly, can change or evolve. Um, if I was there in person with you, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you'd ever heard of Buell, Minnesota. Well, Buell has the finest water in America, if you didn't know, and it's on their uh, water tower. And uh, that's where I grew up. It's a small northeastern town. Um, we uh, Buell's located on the Iron Range, so there's a lot of taconite mining in the region. 
Um, and it's also within the um, upper St. Louis River watershed, with which uh, the watershed and the estuary is considered an area of concern um, by the <clears throat> US EPA and uh, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, the watershed itself continues to be at the crux of debates about iron mining and a, more recently copper and tin mining. And I wonder, I can't help but wonder how changing land uses might change this water narrative of, of Buell having the finest water in America. So I'm a social scientist and I love thinking about water narratives. Here's another narrative of water in Minnesota. Um, and it runs counter to the land of sky blue waters. 56% of waters assessed in the state are impaired. Every county in our state has an impaired water uh, body, whether it's a stream or a lake. When science, biophysical science investigates, or geochemical science, the sources of water impairment in our state, we see a host of drivers like agricultural systems uh, when it comes to nitrate. Crops are a primary source of nitrate impairments that affect surface and groundwater across the state. Uh, so the question becomes, um, what causes these problems? How do we let these problems persist? Is it because people don't care about water so much as we think they do? Is it because our biophysical and geochemical science or water management technologies are lagging? Or is it because we are failing to create a sociopolitical system and governance institutions that support and inspire community-centered water relationships? Relationships in which are inane connections to and cultural values for clean and safe water, our life force, are celebrated, restored, and protected. So these are tough questions. These are big questions. Um, and I spent, as I said, a couple of decades trying to get to the bottom of that human and social dimensions of water. We conducted a statewide survey of Minnesota residents in 2018. And it um, shows that uh, water is important to residents in Minnesota. We asked how important are clean streams, rivers, and lakes to the quality of a community. And um, more than 95%, uh, 99% of folks said it's either um, slightly to extremely important. And 75% um, you know, said water is extremely important to the quality of life in our in my community and i think um, folks from uh, sioux falls and elsewhere in the sioux river basin probably can understand that and and feel that as well that's why the, you do the work that you do um i will present more findings from both this large-scale effort in minnesota the statewide survey and more uh uh, a smaller a smaller scale survey efforts aimed at documenting these diverse narratives of water and culture. But first I want to address up front what I think is the biggest threat to water restoration and protection. And it's not nitrates, it's not bacteria, it's not um, stormwater runoff, it's our management approaches. Um, the approach of and and the conventional, I think, wisdom has been to focus on practices, best management practices, stormwater management infrastructure, engineering solutions, and we put practices before people. And let me explain a little bit more about what I mean. Now, I hope you can see this all right. Um, I love data and I'm gonna be presenting some statistics and, and bar charts to you. Um, as we as we continue. So this comes from two different surveys, uh, a survey in the middle Minnesota River watershed, very polluted watershed, and the Twin Cities Metro, uh, uh, which included several watersheds. Um, and we asked the question, to what extent do you agree with these statements? So we have a, a rural example in the gold uh, of the, the gopher maroon and gold, and we have the maroon is is urban, right? So um, regardless of where uh, respondents lived in urban or a rural setting, their, their responses to this question were, were largely sim similar when it comes to their own abilities to take action to make a difference. 
So 64% uh, and 67% of, of people agree that they are able to work together or to have an impact to make their communities a better place. So lots of confidence in sort of the self-efficacy. Now, when we asked about leadership in the community, we got a much different response from two thirds to one third of people agreeing that their neighborhood has strong leadership or that their community has the leadership uh, it needs to protect water resources. So what I'm seeing here uh, is a, a bit of a gap in the confidence in myself to make change versus the confidence in the leadership uh, to, to protect water. So I think that's important. Here's another example. Um, uh, we asked this question in two different rural watersheds in the lower Minnesota River and the middle Minnesota River, and we got similar responses, right? So we asked similar questions in different basins to see if these scales are reliable, if the, if the survey instruments um, are reliable, or if there are differences. We don't see many differences here. We had more than 60% of, uh, or 60 to 70% of respondents saying um, that they intend to engage in conservation tillage. We had more than 50% say they intend to engage in cover crops. Now these are large landowners, predominantly farmers or farmland owners, and to protect wetlands on, on their land or property. So really high in, intentions to engage in these practices. Um, but the disconnect comes when we ask them about sort of their civic engagement in conservation. So we find that while people are willing to adopt practices individually, they're not willing to talk to each other or to work with one another to protect water um, as they are to adopt practices. And really to me, this speaks of this relationship problem, relationship issue, this gap between private level and collective level action points to the lack of relationships and the need for relationship building. I don't know if it's, you know, Minnesota nice, people are too reserved, um, and not not uh, likely to knock on their neighbor's door to talk about water, to talk about conservation, um, but it's there. It's a phenomenon that I think we need to address. And I'm curious to know if, if that resonates with, with you all in, uh, in the Big Sioux River uh, in South Dakota. We can even show this spatially, and I, I like this map because it's not a map of land uses like you might might think, but it's a map, it's social data. We've mapped intention to adopt a buffer in, in green here. You can see uh, where folks, uh, respondents to our survey said they are, they have uh, uh, high intentions. They're very likely to adopt a buffer um, and that's the green. And then the lowest uh, likelihood of adopting a buffer. Um, and again, these are reported, right? These, this is social data. So these are reports from people um, are in red. So you can see this difference here. And then we asked the same question and mapped out um, the likelihood of talking to others about those practices. And we see that that difference, right? From a lot of green to uh, a lot of yellow and uh, more neutrality. Well, yeah, I could do the practice, but I'm not sure I wanna talk to other people about it. I think that's a problem that we need to address. And I love this quote by um, Admiral Grace Murray Hopper, who's who's a um, uh, she was a naval officer and a computer pioneer. She actually joined the U.S. Naval Reserve soon after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 79 years ago today. Right? Um, she said that you manage things, but you lead people, and I think that that idea is really important because I think we focus too much on managing water in uh, the water profession and water planning um, and not enough on being leaders, on leading people. Our management is very prescriptive and I think we need to think more about collaboration, collaborative approaches to um, uh, leading and engaging people in communities. So let's talk a little bit more about social action and institutional change. Um, uh, water solutions, if water problems are social, then the solutions must be socially driven. And I, when I think about that, I mean, not only top down, but bottom up, middle out, we can't develop a community centered framework for water leadership without engaging all communities. Within this, there are fundamental questions about water justice, 
and um, how we care for water and how we care for each other. And, and central for me is this thinking about water values. How do we value water? I know from research, social science research and theory that values drive action. Um, and so there are questions about what do we value about water? Um, whose relationships to water are prioritized in policies and programs? I think social science is key, not just because I'm a social scientist, but um, it helps support more inclusive and equitable and just decision making. Um, and that matters. That's really important when you're making decisions about water and, and trying to not just educate people, but inspire people to take action. So to understand what it is about water that is so important to the vast majority of Minnesotans, we did conduct this uh, survey, a statewide survey of Minnesota water values. And the dots here are just reflecting where responses came from. We got a really good response in this survey. Um, we asked questions about what people value when it comes to water. And I'm gonna share with you some of the research findings um, from this research. So I'm gonna start simple with some simple statistics, but then we're gonna get a little more complicated and maybe a little uncomfortable, um, but statistics can do that to a person, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to help you through it. So let's start simple. Um, it's a 17 item scale here um, in which we ask people to rate the, how important each of these water values is to protect. Okay, so it was um, uh, on a scale. You can see here these 17 items. And what I'm displaying in this chart is uh, folks who identified this value as extremely important. So, you know, it went from not at all important to extremely important. And these are folks that gave this value high priority in, in their um, response to the, to the question. Um, so we can see the percentage of respondents who identified these as extremely important. And what do you see? Um, drinking water, is at the top with 96% of respondents who say uh, that water uh, supply for law, for, I'm sorry, that drinking water is extremely important all the way down to 15% of folks who say water supply for lawns is extremely important. So my first impression here, and maybe yours too, is that people assign a lot of importance, extreme importance to a lot of different water values. And I think that makes sense, right? I mean, water is a, a central component of our lives, part of our everyday rituals, social activities, and central to many of our celebrations. Um, if we look a little more deeply, we can say, okay, well, let's, let's look at uh, the, the point where half of the folks said it was extremely important or more. And so those are kind of maybe this framework of water values all the way from drinking water to water supply for energy and ag industry. We see that nine items are extremely important here. Um, and then we can start to think about even some more fundamental or basic or core values, um, which here would include drinking water, future generations, uh, protecting water for fish and wildlife habitat, safe beaches and lakes, and interestingly, not polluting neighbors downstream. Minnesota is a kind of an upstream state. We, um, uh, um, the vast majority of our water flows out of our state. And so we need to think about, a lot of us think about those neighbors downstream, Canada um, and, and South as well. Uh, Great Lakes is another uh, important basin. So um, we can think about these, these items um, and we can assume uh, you know, that if the vast majority of folks, two thirds or more, um, rate these as important, they are core or central to the communities of Minnesota water belief system. So here's just another way to visualize these respondents that drinking water is at the core, that like at the very, um, uh, fundamentally at the very least, we need to protect drinking water for survival, right? And then, um, here, here are another set of values, including protecting water for future generations, fish and wildlife, safe beaches, 
and downstream communities. And here's where I would say, does this resonate with you all in the Big Sioux watershed or in South Dakota? Um, that, you know, that's something to think about. What are our core water values? And then we ask, are we achieving these goals in terms of protecting water for these values? And I, I kind of think that this should be at the center of the dialogue around water in our state, in Minnesota at least. Um, you know, should these values guide policies, programs, and monitoring? And I would say yes. And part of the problem is that we're not meeting these goals of protecting water for these core values. Now, okay, so same, same 17 item scale, but we asked the Clean Water Council, which is made up of water experts with the authority in Minnesota to distribute more than $200 million for water projects every year. And we have the same 17 item scale and we wanted to find out, well, how do the, the people in charge, how the people in charge of, of funding um, value water and we can take a look. Well, here's the cut point between 50% uh, and 49%. Um, we have uh, five of these items that make that cut off. Um, and then we can look at, you know, that two thirds rule, the core values. We see some differences. Um, and, and it's important to think about how these differences that maybe um, lack of alignment between residents across the state and our decision makers what that means for spending and allocation to different water programs and then a return on investment. <clears throat> so let's take a look just, um, you know, what we see from this scale, the 17 item scale administered to the Clean Water Council is that natural systems and processes really comes into play as a priority value, which wasn't in that top, you know, two thirds list for um, residents across the state. Uh, we also see other values kind of get pushed out a bit, say beaches and lakes um, and downstream communities. So is this to say that water professionals or, or water decision makers and policy makers in, in Minnesota don't care about safe beaches or downstream communities? No, but I think it's interesting to look at and to start to imagine how decisions might be different if different people were making those decisions. Okay, so this is a side by side now analysis and I promise this this would get more complicated and it's getting more complicated. Um, so this chart compares resident respondents in uh, maroon and in gold, we have the Clean Water Council much smaller sample, but big enough to kind of look at some of these comparisons. What's interesting here is we see. Um, uh, a, a lot of statistical differences anything in color. Any bars that aren't gray means there's a statistical uh, difference and it's significant. Uh, and then we can look at um, some common ground, drinking water, future generations, fish and wildlife habitat. People agree with those as being extremely important and core to Minnesota water values. Um, but then we see a lot of differences and um, almost universally those differences mean that Minnesota residents value these benefits and uses to a greater extent than the Clean Water Council. And I have highlighted the ones that are uh, re represent a 20 point or higher difference. So for example, not polluting neighbors downstream, 67% of residents said this is extremely important and only 45% of Clean Water Council uh, members and affiliate partners said this was uh, extremely important. And we see differences in water supply for energy and ag industry as well. So interesting. And like I said uh, uh, in the earlier slide, natural systems and processes becomes more important to the council members and partners than it is to Minnesota residents. Okay, so just stepping back from the statistics, we can see, we get a sense for these targets now, I think, that drinking water is fundamental and then we have this, this second tier or, or um, sphere of values that are really central. And then around the periphery, we have some of these other values. But I think for me, I think about, well, this is our Minnesota water values. This is our water ethic. Um, and again, uh, uh, 
Does this vary uh, state to state? Is this universal? Um, some of you may remember from high school or college, um, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs first introduced in 1943 and then revised in 1987. It's a theory of motivation that basically argues that we have needs at different levels from more central to more peripheral. And those needs help us survive and thrive. Um, our primal needs like food, water, shelter, air. Um, and then we have more peripheral needs that help us reach sort of self-actualization and fulfillment. Um, environmental psychology research shows that these needs and related values drive behavior, drive environmental behavior. And so we also see this continuum of the characteristics of these values um, from more values that are more variable and maybe we see more dissonance, right? Potential for conflict uh, down to fewer variables like drinking water, right? That's our primal need that are more universal and more stable. And so important questions when you think about water justice and environmental justice is whose needs are fulfilled and whose are not? And how do we address those injustices? And I think water teaches us a lot, again, about our relationships to, to the natural world, but also to each other. So water justice is everyone's responsibility. Um, and I think that um, many of the projects that I've been a part of show that water justice <clears throat> is as fundamental to solving water problems from nitrate to bacteria from, to droughts and flooding um, as other biophysical monitoring and other um, aspects of water leadership and water management. Part of our jobs as water resource professionals and scientists demands that we ask some of these uncomfortable questions. Whose values and beliefs drive water policy? Whose water relationships are prioritized in water programs? And I think social science can help us make these decisions and, and ensure that they're just. Um, so these are two photos of uh, communities in South Minneapolis and North Minneapolis that I think kind of demonstrate visually um, some injustices in water programs and water policies. Water is a human right. Um, access to clean and abundant water and the many benefits, those more peripheral benefits of human of, of water is not should not be a luxury or privilege for those who can afford it or those who are able to live in neighborhoods or own homes with a high capacity to manage or protect water. Um, water should not be an asset to white affluent communities and a liability to black, indigenous, and communities of color or communities living in poverty. As with many other things, the benefits and burdens of water are not distributed equally across landscapes and human communities. Um, and similarly, as water is a human right, it's also a human responsibility and really a social responsibility because water problems are social problems. So at my center, we're asking questions like, how would water planning and policy be different if BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities were fairly represented in decision-making? Um, and we can ask questions about how, you know, decision-making in Sioux Falls would be different um, if the more than 30,000 black and brown people uh, living in that community were um, in charge of making decisions about water management. Um, so here's, here's the survey again, just showing um, the resident survey, showing where we heard from people. And because we had such a low response from BIPOC, black, indigenous and people of color, in the, the residential survey, the statewide survey, we decided to conduct a survey that was focused in the Twin Cities. And it was on site. So we attended community events, cultural events in 2019. We had multilingual staff and signage. We had a visually engaging exhibit. We provided an incentive and an opportunity for all ages to participate. 
and we got almost um, 500 responses. And I love, I love this uh, slide because it, it really demonstrates something that I've never been able to really accomplish before in a survey, which is um, this high representation of BIPOC uh, res respondents. Um, you can see that uh, uh, whites only represent about a third, less than a third of the responses to the survey. It was the first water-related survey we had conducted in which BIPOC respondents represented the majority. And in this pilot survey, we needed to get, um, we needed to group respondents to allow for statistical analysis. So we grouped those who identified as white into our white subgroup and those who identified as other races or ethnicities as BIPOC. This method has a lot of problems, of course. BIPOC does not come close to doing justice to the diversity of experiences and perspectives of Black Americans, Indigenous peoples, or other cultures. However, we believe there's real value in, um, in insights to be gained by filtering out the dominant uh, racial and ethnic identity in this case, white um, or narrative in, in this analysis. Okay, so um, you might notice uh, similar items, but it's, it's pared down. So we now have a 10 item scale because we did this on site. We didn't wanna have people spend 20 minutes filling out a long survey. And we have added a couple of items that we thought would be important, including watering vegetable gardens, and um, values of religious water for religious and cultural practices. So uh, here's that cut point um, for, and, and I'm going to focus on um, BIPOC respondents. We had almost 300 BIPOC respondents, um, and you can see the the shaded gray uh, values. There was no statistical difference between white respondents and BIPOC respondents. Um, we do see uh, a couple of, of uh, values at the top that were very consistent, right, with our residential survey, drinking water and not polluting neighbors uh, downstream. Um, but we also see variations in, by race and ethnicity, right? Um, quality recreation, reducing water treatment costs, the value of anglers to fish for uh, preferred species, um, and religious and cultural practices, those all had a differential of 20 points or more with BIPOC respondents rating those as, as more important um, than, than our white respondents. Um, so with an environmental justice frame, we would ask, well, how do our policies and programs prioritize water for watering vegetable gardens or religious and cultural practices or urban quality urban recreation, urban fishing? we see some higher variation among these values uh, that represent what I would say are unique cultural relationships with water. Water narratives matter. Um, on average, BIPOC respondents are significantly more concerned, we learned from this on-site survey, than white respondents about water damage to homes and about uh, water supply, safe, safe water supply. <clears throat> we also uh, learned on average that BIPOC respondents reported being less familiar with water issues in their community and uh, yet place higher importance on learning more about water than our white respondents did. So uh, I promised the community-centered framework for water, and um, I want I want to talk a little bit more about this. And I, I firmly believe that local water organizations that I think many of you represent um, and other stakeholders at the local level level are best positioned to do this work. Um, but you need support from states and and federal uh, agencies. So building community capacity and supporting uh, water justice. Um, a few ideas here from me, how to do this. Uh, I think we need to put people first. Whenever we think about water, we need to think about people and how people influence water and are influenced by water. Just this morning, I, I was on another Zoom call. I was on a Zoom call with um, 
uh, some officials uh, with our Metropolitan Council here in the Twin Cities, and they manage lots of things, um, including environmental services. And this woman that I was talking to, quote, she said, environmental services has done a good job of insulating our work from people. We work with public works directors and public water suppliers across the metro. We work with providers, not people. And uh, I mean, providers are people too, for sure. But I think you get her message that she's felt insulated because the services um, are operated by a few um, and she works more with them than, than the community. Research shows that people value clean water and want it protected for their families, for their neighbors, and for future generations. And also, you know, we need to put people first because policies and programs don't protect water, right? People protect water. Okay, and then here's the next one. Put women in charge. So cue the turntable needle scratching sound uh, on the vinyl record, right? Eh? Um, how would planning, water planning and policy be different if women were fairly represented in decision making? And really, we, we do need water leaders with different water relationships and cultural identities in charge. Um, and I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean and why I think it's important to put women in charge. Um, we also need to prioritize relationships and community engagement in water. Partnering with community organizations of influence, not just water organizations or environmental advocacy groups, but, but organizations who deal with housing or working on social justice issues and other public wellness. Those are our water allies um, because they are committed to community. Develop leaders among staff and community members um, and I mean leaders versus managers, right? People who can lead people, uh, provide regular social and ecological feedback about success and failures. And I think, and not just because I'm a social scientist, but I think social science can guide communication and community engagement. Okay, so putting women in charge. Here's the scale again. We're back to the 17 point scale. This is the statewide resident survey. And if we were together, I would say, how would you, now that you're a budding social scientist, um, how would you interpret this chart? Um, okay, so first we have statistically different scores on 14 out of the 17 values. We see a 20 point difference on three of these values. What we're seeing is that from, from this analysis that, that Respondents who identified as female across the board almost on 14 out of 17 values place higher importance on water than our respondents who identify as male. Um, statistically, we might call this a phenomenon of global amplification of the importance of water uh, in water values among women. So uh, we hold a lot of focus groups in my work. We do a lot of interviews and qualitative research as well. And uh, we want to get community members involved in the conversations about these survey data because they're limited. They, they give you snapshots, but it's the meaning behind it is really important. What resonates with community members, what's counter to their experiences and what it means for them. Um, I've asked many community groups to reflect on this chart, this exact chart. Um, and uh, people who identify as female consistently um, rate these water values more important than males. And I've said, what, it, what do you have to say about this phenomenon? Um, and the response almost universally has been, of course you found that, women care more. Um, I've had respondents talk about, or participants talk about the ethic of care, the responsibilities to family, children, pets, gardens, the, the weight of future generations, and even uh, the respect for other beings as being consistent with this, this chart, these data. Um, the survey says that they are spot on. In fact, further analysis showed that fem female respondents were significantly more concerned than male respondents about the consequences of water problems um, for human health, for future generations, 
for people in their communities and for downstream communities as well. Okay, so a few more slides. What I wanna show you is uh, what I believe is a powerful community-centered approach uh, that acknowledges multiple narratives of community and water and acknowledges not only the capacities, but the constraints that communities face. Um, and it's really kind of simple, uh, but, but important. And I think the overall message is that communities have lots of resources and different capacities. And as water resource professionals or scientists, we need to understand and mobilize all of these capacities and not just focus on programs and policies, but think about individuals, their beliefs and values, their civic action, their private conservation practices on their in their own households or on their lands. We need to think about the relationships that people have. How do people influence one another? How do social networks form? What are some of the norms in the community when it comes to water? Um, organizations, and I don't just mean uh, watershed organizations or lake associations, but real community organization. What makes them successful? How do they develop leaders? Why are they trusted or, or organizations of influence in a community? And then the fourth level of community capacity is programmatic capacity. And that's really kind of where the rubber hits the road in terms of setting goals, reaching objectives, setting objectives and taking action coordinating across jurisdictions or across communities, tracking and then adaptation. Um, equity is critical. It's a critical concept that, that transcends these boundaries and is important uh, in terms of trust, legitimacy and fairness at every level of community. And then of course, I think we've demonstrated how much culture plays a role in people's relationships to water and their water narratives. I think we've tended to focus our efforts on programmatic capacity, setting goals, um, uh, uh, developing strategies, taking tactics and, and, and um, uh, implementing practices or adopting practices. We focused on that. And, and we've we've focused a little bit on on the individual capacity because I know all of you are reaching out to landowners and other community members about what they can do as individuals. But there's so much in between programs and individuals that that I think is just ripe for um, tapping into. It's a community assets that we haven't activated or acknowledged like we can in water leadership. Healthy waters require healthy social relationships. Um, and this model that I've developed with a colleague, Aaron Seekamp, um, has guided state level planning and funding in Minnesota. It's, it's been the center of regional training programs for water resource, resource professionals and local level civic engagement strategies. Um, I would argue that monitoring the social and cultural relationships with water is just as important or even more important than um, monitoring water contaminants or constructing stormwater infrastructure. The social science of water helps to elevate hidden narratives, right? Questions like what are residents' values? What constrains conservation? What drives civic engagement? And many other questions. Um, and it also uh, helps elevate these hidden narratives of water community and culture uh, that can inspire and support uh, collective uh, engagement. Okay, so five lessons um, from me that I hope uh, resonate with you um, are that water problems are social problems, that unfortunately our programs have, have conventionally put practices before people. There are a lot of examples of where we've gone beyond that paradigm, right? And, and really focus, focusing on engaging people where they are. Social action and institutional change are essential to uh, solving water problems or addressing water problems. And water justice really is everyone's responsibility to ask these difficult questions, these uncomfortable questions, and to think about who we represent and who we're not representing in water. And then I gave you a, a community-centered framework for water. 
just as a, a kind of a teaser to think about how we can more holistically engage all the capacities, all the resources of community. Um, a final quote um, is, is from Margaret Mead, who is an American cultural anthropologist, and she says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, concerned citizens can change the world. Um, indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. All right. Um, one last thing, and this is a little bit unusual for me, and I, I'm going to do it anyway, is that I don't usually make public requests for help, but this was an email that came to me just today from a dear friend of mine who is Lakota and lives in present day South Dakota. And it just seemed to me incredibly fortuitous that I'm speaking with all of you about the Big Sioux River, all of you South Dakotans, um, and it seemed like the right thing to do to share this request for uh, COVID relief donations. Um, a, a Lakota elder artist and storyteller, Tony Horse Road, and maybe some of you know Tony. He's been featured in South Dakota PBS special um, and other places. He's an artist, um, very passionate, and his wife recently uh, just passed from COVID. And so uh, he, he's also, um, because of, of this unfortunate situation he's become homeless and he's lost a lot of his art supplies and so they're looking for art supply donations or financial donations to help uh, Mr. Horse Road. So if anyone is interested in learning more or if you're in a position to help feel free to reach out to me and there's my email address and I can connect, connect you with my friend who's leading this effort. Okay and this is my acknowledgement slide. If you want to learn more about that model of community capacity and inspiring action. We've got a free book online um, at this site called Inspiring Action at the freshwater.org site. And it's free to download or just to peruse. And there've been a lot of folks who've participated in this work, of course. Um, and yeah, I think I am probably out of time, but I'm happy to entertain any questions if folks have, have questions for me or comments or critiques. I'd love to hear it all. Okay, thank you very much, May. Uh, please add your comments, questions to the chat bar. Uh, we have one question slash maybe comment. Uh, was the MPCA's decision to permit the Enbridge pipeline to cross the <laughs> land an example of putting people first? That is a great question. Um, well, uh, it depends on who you are, I guess. Um, I think that there are certainly a lot of communities who are um, who feel that that that's not putting uh, community first or people first, um, especially given the uh, you know the sacred lands and the um, ancestral lands of the Ojibwe and the Shinabe people and Dakota people in that region. Very controversial. I think it's an example of where there's a lot of healing that needs to be done um, and there will continue to be uh, I think a lot of contention about these decisions um, and yeah I mean I think I think that is a conflict that will certainly continue to fester um, and be a source of real pain <laughs> real pain um, and for some real promise uh, uh, in terms of the economics of Minnesota all right how did survey respondents evaluate their awareness slash willingness to do the right thing compared to that of their neighbors? Hmm. Um, so we, um, we asked folks to, uh, we've done, asked different questions in surveys about practices like adopting cover crops, um, and or uh, having a, a rain garden in your in your yard, for example. And consistently, what we've seen from all of these surveys is that people say they have high intentions to adopt these practices as individuals. Um, but when we ask questions about engaging with their neighbors or engaging with uh, the broader community around or even just talking to people about these practices, 
we see those intentions really drop. It's just it's it's been this uniform gap that we've seen in environmental behavior. Um, and so we're trying to trying to understand that better. Um, and I think that part of the problem is that our programs have focused so much on individual practices, adopt this buffer, uh, put in a uh, rain barrels, use pervious pavement, but haven't also been supportive of the relationships that are needed um, to build sort of a culture around that or a community norm around water protection. And so I think that's what's been missing. And so that's why we're seeing this reticence to talk to people about it, um, talk to people about conservation. Okay. Can you give an example of a Minnesota community where these concepts have been put into practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a county just south southwest of here called Scott County, um, their land manager and water manager um, used the community capacity scale or community capacity model as a, a outline for his uh, water plan uh, in the county. And so they benchmark these community capacity um, targets and they really transformed their relationships with landowners in that they didn't only talk to landowners when they needed something from them um, or when they were selling a practice, but they went out and talked to landowners just to build relationships. Um, and uh, it's really it's really been uh, beneficial to their programming and they've actually seen uh, water quality improvements because they've had a lot more consistent adoption and engagement uh, among community members, among landowners than they had prior. They do uh, thank you celebrations and picnics. They've done, um, uh, they've uh, put articles in the newspaper about conservation champions in the community. So it's become more of the cultural norm for um, uh, how people manage their land in, in Scott County. Okay, thank you. Uh, for those who said they were not going to engage in a BMP, did you delve into why they weren't? In the in the best management practices? Yes. Um, yeah. So um, while there, we've learned that there are uh, some key constraints to adoption of those practices. One being um, the the skepticism about how they worked. Um, the skepticism about why the practice it will lead to water quality or um, you know what that feedback is and I, I mentioned feedback and um, a lot of the in, in terms of agricultural producers really want feedback right they, they um, are making decisions every season based on uh, feedback from weather feedback from last season soil soil um, health and things like that um, and not seeing feedback from practices uh, has been a, a challenge has been a problem the only feedback they're getting is about yield you know and crops not about water quality and so there's just a general skepticism that anything that an individual does will really make a difference um, and then of course there's financial barriers um, and other challenges as well all right and the last one says it's just a comment, but uh, thank you very much for your thoughtful research and presentation because it can be difficult. I think this is a perspective that is often overlooked. I appreciate the conclusions and contrast between values and actual practices and hope our programs can continue to grow to better reflect water values in the future. And it looks like one more. How do your five topics apply when dealing with endangered and or invasive species? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, we've done some work on, on a species level. Um, and I think, again, values are really critical to that. I mean, in culture, um, for, for many indigenous people, there's no such thing as an invasive species that they're all relatives and 
So there are different management approaches uh, to invasive species um, that reflect our belief systems, our worldviews. Um, and so understanding how a particular community relates to native and non-native uh, or invasive species is, is really important. It's those values and kind of meeting people where they are. Um, yeah, but I think I think you need social science research to really you know, get to the bottom of that um, and to better understand how people, what re what relationships exist with those species and, and what are the narratives in a community? Okay, I'm not seeing any more. So uh, May, thank you very much for your time today and for being our keynote speaker. Some very valuable information there. We, uh, uh, I think we all have a lot long ways to go, but uh, this group and the people on this call are all the folks that are looking to make change. And so hopefully we're all taking another step in the right direction. So thank you very much. All right, all right. absolutely. This was fun and feel free to email me if you have questions or, or comments. I'd be happy to, to chat more offline with folks. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll wrap things up. We're just a shade after five uh, today. Thanks again to everybody for uh, joining us today. For those that are uh, interested in PDH credits, continuing education credits, please reach out to Troy or Colin in our office to work with the, those uh, numbers. And otherwise, thank you very much for your time and hopefully we'll see you in person next year.